Hello and welcome to Cinema 130 Film Appreciation. This is our second week. Today we're going to get into story and how films are created and crafted and into narrative, narrative structure, and some elements of character. So we have a lot to cover, so let me share my screen and we'll get right into it. So we're in week two and you want to make sure and have your book open. So we're going to talk about story today and film stories have a pretty common structure. So a little business first, uh, we're in week two. You wanna make sure you look for the page numbers in the right hand of the screen, that's where they'll be. So hopefully you're following along with your book, you'll get the most out of the lecture if you do that. And of course, hopefully you completed homework one, we have a quiz in two weeks. Okay, moving on. Evidence strongly suggests that all humans in all cultures come to cast their own identity in some sort of narrative form. We are inherent storytellers. And aren't we also inherent story watchers? We love movies, TV shows, blogs. We love people telling us a story, okay? It's become very important in our culture. It's through stories and through myths that we learn lessons and we grow as people. That's why they're so important in our culture today. So, we can say that all stories can be boiled down to hero goes on a journey or trouble comes to town. If you think about it, most stories, there's always exceptions, are either a, a hero going on a goal, having a goal and seeking uh, that goal through a journey. That journey could be physical as in traveling, but it also could be emotional or mental. And then you have trouble comes to town. The character is perfectly happy and something bad happens, some unfortunate incident that forces them to adjust. So. This is a really important phase of, of filmmaking and brainstorming. You've got to have an idea to get started. And stories come from many different sources, particularly films, love, novels, comic books. Uh, sometimes TV shows get made into movies, uh, historic events, personal stories, even the newspaper and character backstory. We see that a lot with sequels. <clears throat> so narrative structure is also referred to as the storyline or plot line describes the framework of how one tells a story. It's how a movie is organized and the plot is unveiled. Now, most stories revolve around a single question that represents the core of the story. So will Harry Potter defeat Voldemort? Will Romeo and Juliet hook up? Um, these stories of events that uh, follow an attempt to answer this defining question. So whatever happens after answers the question, resolves the film in the climax, and then concludes. That's the point of a movie. It's, uh, it wraps up in a relatively short amount of time. So here we have a classic story. So once upon a time, there was a princess. So we've got setting and characters, all right? We would say that this is the state of equilibrium. This, the character is just normal. All right, she lives in a castle, so now we know where she is. Then there's an inciting incident, something happens until one day a prince came, but there are problems. Now this creates disruption in her world. Uh, we see rising action with battles fought, which they eventually won, this is our climax. Then there was a wedding at the castle and everyone lived happily ever after. So now we have the falling action, the resolution, and we've returned to equilibrium changed by the story. This is the most classic and basic way of understanding a story. So story, also we use this term narrative. It follows characters on a journey through conflict, has a beginning, middle, and end. That's the most simple. So narrative story, same thing. Equilibrium and disruption, we, disup we define those terms. So in, <clears throat> in this example, we have Neo, he's, uh, he's at equilibrium. He's not happy in his office, but there he is. Uh, he meets uh, Morpheus, who offers him the red pill. He takes it, and then he wakes up into a new reality. Okay? So, parts of narrative. These are a couple of terms which are good to know. We have exposition, complication, or inciting incident. We've already seen that term. Rising action, building to a climax. Afterwards, falling action and a resolution. And we divide this into a three-act story structure. This is the most common way films are organized and theater as well. Act one, act two, act three. So film adopted this from theater. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So let's go through all these various forms, all right? So exposition is where the story is explained. It can be through narration, imagery, or scenes. Exposition covers the setting, the character, and the backstory. So basically, who is the, what's the story? 
who's our main character, what do they care about, so on and so forth. Um, once in a while, films will have a narrator start that out. But as we see in, in Star Wars, we have an exposition example in the form of the long scroll that starts the film that sort of sets it up. So that's exposition, okay, through narration, printed narration. But then the story begins when Darth Vader begins to seek, seek the stolen plans, okay? That explains and sets up the story that we're going to follow for the film. Inciting incident, the moment that kicks the story off could be a chance meaning or misfortune. So in Star Wars, the droids land on the planet where Luke Skywalker was, pretty convenient. Uh, in adaptation, the film we're going to watch for our um, uh, case study, Charlie Meets Val, that kicks the story off. And in 500 Days of Summer, a romance, Tom and Summer meet cute inside of an elevator. So that kind of kicks the story off. They complicate the protagonist's life, disrupting their equilibrium and setting them on the journey. Then we have rising action. So I illustrated this example through a Kung Fu film. So in a Kung Fu film, you're not gonna fight the master until you have beat all the henchmen along the way. So you have your first fight and you fight some henchmen and then eventually you work your way to the master. So this is an example of rising action. The action must continue to rise, get more difficult and more interesting. You don't wanna have the best part first, right? And then we reach the climax. That's where the, 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 the two characters, the antagonist and protagonist finally get to battle. It's uh, where the romantic couple get back together or in the case of Star Wars, where they have the final trench run fight um, where the couple hooks up. This is where it all comes together, either a final battle or a final reconciliation, depending on the film. Then we go into falling action. We got to tie up the loose ends of the film. Now, this part is usually shorter in a film. Um, usually once the, the narrative has been resolved, the climax has been reached, man, it's time to get out because people have been satisfied. The reason that they, they've been paying attention has been satisfied. So equilibrium is restore, restored. Here, the heroes are rewarded. 500 days of summer, he doesn't get the girl. Sorry, spoiler alert. Uh, and the resolution is how it all ends and what lessons were learned, okay? So here it is plotted out the most simple way you possibly can. Exposition leading to rising action, building to a climax, falling action. Now on this chart, these sections receive uh, equal weight. But in actuality, they're going to be only like a quarter or less of the film, maybe 10%. So story elements. We kind of talked about basic story structure here. Um, let's get further into it. So we have setting, plot, structure, characters, heroes. Now we'll cover this material in next week's lesson, so I won't talk about it now. Let's get into the five basic elements, setting, plot, and character. So setting is simply where? The physical location. Now, is it imaginary or real? That's going to determine a lot about the film. Do I have to be historically accurate? Or are we making this up? Interior, exterior. What culture is it set in? Which relates to time period. Okay. So if we're doing a period piece, that's going to greatly affect dialogue and costumes, season and weather, day or night. Also, setting could be said to be related to situation. So in Star Wars, we open in action. And we open with the attack on Princess Leia's ship. And that immediately thrusts us into a very dire situation. We don't even quite know what's on, going on. Then we find out they want the, the stolen plans. And that's the inciting incident. Boom, off we're going. Next, we're going to move on to plot. Now, this is how the story unfolds, the way a story is told. Because remember, in a film, we can jump around in time. We might tell the ending to start to kind of get people excited and then jump back to the beginning. So most films have, this is a basic breakdown. We've kind of covered some of this before in lesson one, but we'll go further. Uh, beginning, a middle, and an end. This is what makes up the movie. Now, the, the beginning is going to be made up of many scenes, probably more than just three, but here I just use three for an example. The middle has scenes and the ending have scenes, all right? Each one of these scenes is broken down into further shots. So we're shooting all the various shots we need to build a scene, which we need to build a movie, okay? So the plot in the film is what happens and it shows cause and effect. It's the driving force in the story. This happens and this response happens and so forth, okay? So the king died and the queen died is a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief is a plot. The time sequence is preserved. There's now a cause and effect. So to keep in mind with a film, you know, a book can be put down and returned to any time. You read a book over several weeks or months. 
But a movie is a singular time-based event. It's a ride for 90 minutes. You must introduce the characters, grab the attention of the audience, move the story along in an interesting way, build to a climax and deliver a satisfying ending. That's what a movie is. Most movies, there are exceptions, of course. Plot. Plots must progress. Sequence events must flow and make sense. In fact, Hitchcock said life, a film is like a life with the boring parts removed. We don't see the characters brushing their teeth every night. We see the interesting parts of the story that move it along. Because we go to movies to be entertained, to escape from our lives for a while. We don't need to watch someone else doing the boring parts of their life. Uh, we want to experience new feelings and new ideas. And we hate to be bored. So movie maxim, show, don't tell. That'll come up again. Remember that one. We want to show people, not tell them. So different types of plots. You have good versus evil, tragedy, comedy, rags to riches. Coming of age is very popular. I'm sure you've seen a lot of those films where you have a younger character who is learning to overcome insecurities, overcome obstacles, mature right in front of our eyes in the film. And of course, the hero's journey, which we'll discuss in detail. So good versus evil is pretty uh, self-explanatory. Most superhero or science fiction films will have some element of that, action films as well. There are tragedies where the hero is doomed to fail and uh, the film is a bit sadder. Uh, we don't see quite as many tragic films today, but they're still out there. And here's some examples. Comedies, of course. Um, it's a humorous look at the character's mistakes. Oftentimes the characters are deeply flawed and... Um, we enjoy seeing them trip through their lives. Rags to riches, you go from poor to rich. Many examples of that. A coming of age. Now, these are films that where a young hero learns to grow up, they find their way, they meet some mentors, and they learn to overcome any insecurities or self-installed obstacles that they might have. And many examples here, many Academy Award winning films. Now, the hero's journey is the ultimate uh, basic storyline or plot line and we're going to discuss that more when we get to hear uh, structure because the hero's journey shows up in a lot of films and most coming of age films are actually a hero's journey where the hero goes on a journey into their unconscious into the special world and returns changed so we say that stories have about eight beats in them that's a kind of a, ba a basic way to uh, organize them let's look at some other structures we have linear episodic three-act story structure, and the hero's journey. Now, <clears throat> a film can be the hero's journey, have a three-act story structure, and be linear. In fact, that's one of the most common forms for film. I'm going to explain them out, but they're, they overlap. They're not mutually exclusive, and they often are used in combination, okay? So a linear narrative is just what it says. It's A, B, C. You know, you go from exposition to conflict to resolution, okay, which is a three-act story structure, by the way. But with linear narratives, time flows in a logical manner. You move from event to event to event. Now, you might have a flashback occasionally in a linear narrative. but still mostly linear. In an episodic story structure, the story can jump around in time and in place. So we might go A, C, D, B, back to A. So there might be multiple different stories, as you see illustrated here, and, and with also one overarching story. So... Episodic story structures are a little different. They're broken up. We can jump around. Uh, let's look at some examples. So linear. I mean, Infinity War is mostly linear. Events happen uh, one after the other, except maybe when they jump back in time. But that happens in the second film. Casablanca, linear. There's a flashback in it, but it's still a linear film. Uh, but Ray, which is a biopic about Ray Charles, any film that's a biopic almost always is linear. They start at the beginning of the character's life and go to the end. These films, though, are more episodic. They jump around in time. They show different characters. They're playing with the structure of the film. They're not just moving from A to Z, okay? So in The Godfather, the very first film is linear, begins at the beginning, goes to the middle and an end. The Godfather 2 follows two separate stories, the, the father's backstory and what happens to Michael after his father dies and he moves on and becomes the godfather. So you have two separate stories and they cut back and forth between the two. That's a classic episodic structure. If you haven't seen those, I recommend them. So linear structure, once again, we go from equilibrium 
to disequilibrium. Something happens and we're forced to change and forced to grow and forced into conflict. And then we arrive at the new equilibrium. Now this brings us to um, the three act structure. Again, it lays over the linear structure very well. We have a beginning, middle and end divided into three different acts. Uh, it's the most common structure for movies, even television shows. Television is a little different because they're shorter, but they will often still have a three-act structure hidden in there. Three-act structure um, is very common. Narrative film divides into three parts. We have an introduction where the characters are set up. Okay, The setting is established. We introduce the world of film. What are the rules? Okay, Can our characters fly? Do they carry a gun? conflicts so this is when you know something goes wrong or their goals run uh, into opposition with someone else the antagonist okay the hero leaves to go on a journey they have a goal they're going to have to change uh resolution conflicts are resolved and the villain is defeated if there is one order is restored here's the three-act story structure you know plotted out again and you notice that it rises in action okay it rises to the climax and this more accurately represents the length of time that you will see in a film. As you can see, the resolution is a smaller section. Intro takes a while to set up. Then we get going with um, big twists and obstacles, building to a climax and so forth. All right. So the last structure, the monomyth, the hero's journey. journey. Same thing, I mean, same thing. It's called the monomyth, which means single myth, is because it's a, a very common template of a broad category of tales and lore that involves a hero who goes on an adventure and in a decisive crisis wins a victory and comes home changed or transformed. So many stories can be boiled down to the monomyth because they're told by cultures across the world. This has been researched by a guy by the name of Joseph Campbell, and he found that disparate cultures who had no connection to one another told similar stories so <clears throat> the hero's journey first there's a call to adventure supernatural aid there's a threshold that you go through okay and th really this it's divided into two parts you're going into the abyss and then coming back and in some ways this re represents all transformation in life when you're very young you're growing up you get your first job you experience the difficulties of that you return home changed things get a little easier with time. So it's got eight beats that we say, so we'll break those down for you. First, you start off in status quo, okay? The character's in a normal state. That's usually, not always, but that's usually where we meet a character in a movie. There's a call to adventure. There's something happens that makes you have to deal with a problem. Or you just have a new goal. You discover you something that's out there that you want to achieve. Along the way, you might meet a mentor, at some point, you must cross the threshold, which means you must take the leap and truly begin the adventure. Along the way, you'll meet allies and you'll have some trials. You'll meet some new foes. In the innermost cave and then onto the abyss is where we meet our darkest moment. And this is uh, where we must fight the final boss. Eventually, we get the reward and we return home. Okay, so this classic organization for a story is another way of looking at it. Um, we see it divided up with a three-act structure. And, you know, different films will focus on different parts more. I mean, act two in particular can be stretched out and act one shortened. Um, so it really depends on the film and what they want to emphasize and how much struggle we want to see the character go through. <clears throat> Here's it simplified. So you have you. Start with you. You have a need. So you go and you search. Then you find it. Then you take it. Then you return now you're changed. So that kind of is another way of understanding the um, hero's journey. And notice that what we have here is we have known world versus unknown world. So we start in the known world and we go into the unknown world like a new relationship, a new job, and we return changed. In one half of the circle, we're in stasis, we're the same. But when we finally get what we want or final or battle our last antagonist, we are changed. So all these movies use, <coughs> excuse me, the hero's journey, um, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Matrix, all of these have uh, very often a young character that has to go on a journey. So they're combining um, the coming of age tale with the hero's journey. They have maybe some powers or maybe they're capable in some ways, but they have to go on a journey to unlock those powers 
and defeat their own insecurities. Here's uh, each of the hero's journey laid out with the inciting in incident, equilibrium and disruption. I'll let you stop the video and take a look at that for yourself if you like those films. Let's move on to plot, plot devices and techniques. So first off, these are good terms for your quiz. We're on page 14, by the way. So we have foreshadowing when, when the uh, writer gives a hint of what's about to happen or happen future in the story. We have backstory, hints of uh, information about the history, about the character's past. We have flashbacks when we actually see the character's past. Flash forwards, the opposite, jumping ahead. Of course, you know, voiceover narration where a narrator tells us information about the story. And internal dialogue where we have their own thoughts. So foreshadowing. Foreshadowing subtly suggests what is coming in the story, okay? So in Psycho, um, our antagonist uh, stuffs birds. And we have a scene where we see him very creepy with all these birds he's stuffing, which hints that he is going to be a murderer. Um, in uh, Avengers Age of Ultron, Ultron says this dialogue here, people create children designed to supplant them, to help them end. And of course he gives birth to vision in the film, all right? So, and even here's a really interesting subtle example of this time mimicking the maze that he will find his demise in, in The Shining. So, uh, backstory, the history of a character that is known or told, uh, but not shown. It's their reputation, their past, their record. It informs the audience about the character, why they have the goals they do, okay? So we don't see backstory, but we hear about it. It's the information we learn about a character when someone else says, yeah, that guy's really smart, or he used to be a cop. That's information that we now get. We don't go back and see it. We don't need to. We just now know this about this character. Main characters tend to have flushed out backstories, at least a little bit. Secondary characters, not so much. So backstory, Star Wars. We learned that Luke's father was killed by Darth Vader. It's the backstory. We never get to see it. In The Empire Strikes Out, we learn that Darth Vader is his father. Sorry, spoiler alert. The backstory comes to the fore a little bit. But in Revenge of the Sith, which was made many years later, we actually get to see the backstory of what happened to Darth Vader. They actually, the movie is about that backstory, okay? Often sequels go into backstory. We saw that with The Godfather. Uh, the Joker goes into the backstory of uh, one of Batman's biggest villains. Um, Solo goes into the backstory of Han Solo off of him being a secondary character. Flashbacks. Now that's when we see the care. We actually go back into the past and they show us the events. They, they're important enough. They want to show us. So here in Casablanca, we see uh, Bogart talking about his past love, and then we see them happy together in Paris. Very often you'll see a dissolve that's associated with the character here. This person is thinking about his days as a fighter pilot. So the so the, the scene dissolves to the plane. And this is sort of illustrating backstory, okay? So that's how flashbacks are different than backstory, okay? Voiceover narration. This is when we can hear a character's voice over the picture, but they're not seen. And this could be a narrator who's telling us the story. We have that in Princess Bride and often in classic uh, uh, fairy tales, we have a narrator and they kind of set things up for us. Um, also with voiceover, that's voice heard over picture, but not seen. You don't see the person talking. You just hear the voice. We have an example of internal dialogue. This is from Memento. So all this dialogue you see here on the screen are his internal thoughts. It's what he's thinking. Their internal thoughts of the character heard by the audience as voiceover. Okay, let's get into some more tools. Okay, how do you make the story more, story more interesting and more exciting to the audience? There's a bunch of things that we can do. So there's suspense, surprise. There's the good old ticking bomb. We see that a lot in James Bond films. Stakes, raising the stakes, making it more important. Plot twist and cliffhanger. Let's get into it. So suspense. Now this is a great tool. It's the state of uncertainty or excitement regarding a specific out outcome. Suspense is typically coupled with feelings of anxi anxiousness and anticipation, all right? So it's when the audience knows something is coming and maybe the characters on the screen don't. You're, you're building to some big climax, you can see it coming, you're not sure how it's gonna resolve, you're in a state of suspense, okay? 
you'll note the visual tone in all these films that I put up that have suspense. You have very darker tones in the movie posters, um, which is tonally conveying that this is going to be a suspense film. Okay, so suspense lasts for, or excuse me, surprise only lasts for a moment, like a jump scare. But suspense builds over time and keeps the audience in anticipation. Like, who is this mother character in Psycho? All right, boom. Now, when the mother character seemingly attacks her in the shower, we didn't expect that coming. That was an example of surprise, okay? That was not really, perhaps it was foreshadowed a little bit, but not too much. Yes, I guess it was in the earlier scene we looked at with the birds. It was foreshadowed that there was some danger there, but we're really surprised when we see the mother attacking her. And then we're surprised when we realize that the mother is actually her son wearing a wig. Sorry, spoiler, spoiler alert, uh, shocking the audience. And this is also an effective tool, but it also satisfies the long running suspension. So another great way to create suspense is the ticking bomb. It's, um, it keeps the audience engaged, provides tension and a deadline. Like if we don't accomplish this, by this time, it now gives you a deadline, and that's really important. That's really what the ticking bomb is, is a deadline. Then bad things are going to happen. So that, that builds suspense and tension for the audience. Another thing that really works, raising the stakes. Every time Thanos gets one of the Infinity Stones in the Avengers movie, then the stakes are raised. He's getting more powerful. He's going to be harder to stop. So in the original Star Wars, in the original script of the movie, the Death Star was not about to destroy the rebel base. They changed it in the end and made the rebel base about to be destroyed, thereby raising the stakes for the characters. It makes it more interesting for the audience if they are in more danger. It's not just that their homework is going to be late. It's just that their whole life might come to an end. Okay, so a plot twist. So sometimes a great thing to do is to have a, a really unique plot twist in the film. And we saw this in Empire Strikes Back when it's revealed that Darth Vader is indeed Luke Skywalker's fa father. And what a plot twist does is it changes the story and its outcome. You thought it was going one way, and now it's going a different way. And it's a surprise and delights the audience if it works. Okay, so it's a dramatic or unexpected change or twist in the expected outcome of the story, okay? Or at least the direction of the story. It's a surprise revelation about the character. Like you thought he was one thing, but it turns out he's not. Uh, sometimes it's a double cross where there's a betrayal. So plot twists can be very, very effective. And there's all kinds of ones like you see in the films here. Often it's with an identity that's hidden um, or we have uh, psychosis in um, Fight Club and Sixth Sense. Now, I don't want to give it away, but uh, they're playing with who characters really are. Cliffhanger is when the episode or the movie ends with not revealing the end, when the character's in dramatic peril, and we cut away, the audience feels tension because they don't know how it's going to be resolved. Um, television shows do this all the time. They end with to be continued, where the character's about to be chopped up, people are tied up. We call this a cliffhanger. Most episodic television ends on a cliffhanger, but even Infinity War ends on a bit of a cliffhanger because now the characters are at their lowest point. They've been defeated by Thanos. Moving on to some more plot devices, we have story within a story. Okay, that's when the story is existing inside of a larger story that we're watching. Uh, we could have characters going on a quest. We could have a messiah story where a prophesied, prophesied sized hero, excuse me, comes to right all wrongs and restore balance to the world. Um, we could also see a newcomer. Let me give you examples of all these. So story within a story. Now, guess what? Big hint. All, not all, but many of the films that we're going to watch this semester, including Adaptation, Grand Budapest Hotel, and Birdman, all have a story within a story. So in addition to the movie and the characters you're watching, they're working on a story that we also get to witness inside of the movie. So that's a wonderful way to work. It allows you to have an extra layer of commentary because you have a story that's being resolved inside of another story. We have the quest. Certainly we see that with um, Avengers, Indiana Jones, uh, movies where they're seeking something out, just the you know, power, survival, victory. The Messiah story where there's some sort of prophesied young person usually comes from a broken home or is an orphan. Um, they possess unique gifts, but they often don't realize them yet. And they have to 
get guidance from an older mentor, mentor, and they might have a character flaw that saves them in the end. And we see this in film after film. This is John Carter from uh, John Connor from Terminator. Also the newcomer. Now this is a great device. How many times have you seen in a movie where there's a new employee or a young person that has to have the world of the movie explained to them? Well, this is why you see it so much, okay? The newcomer is new to the world, just like the audience, and they must experience it together. The audience identifies with this character, and it must also, it also sets up a great opportunity for exposition, where you can explain things, because the character doesn't know how things work in the office. Someone has to tell them, thereby telling the audience. So more plot devices. So we have the MacGuffin, the love triangle, plot voucher, plot armor. Okay, here we go. Okay, so a MacGuffin is basically a distraction. It's a red herring. It's something you think is important in a movie, but isn't. Great example would be the suitcase in Pulp Fiction. It shows up early in the mo movie. Some of the characters are trying to get it. We think it's money. They never even show it to us. It's a mystery. And then it never shows up again in the film. We think it's important, but it's not. Love triangle is just what it, it says here is that uh, three people engaged in a, in a triangle of love competing. Now, plot voucher is interesting. I'm, I'm sure you know what this is. Basically, whenever a, a protagonist is given a tool or a device in a film, it's going to show up later to be essential. This is part of something we call Chekhov's gun. So, for example, in Lord of the Rings, at one point he gets this uh, magical glass that will light up. And of course, later on the story, that becomes essential. Now, the easiest example is James Bond. Early in the film, he always gets some new fantastic device. And sometimes they're obscure or silly, like being able to breathe underwater. Well, later in the film, it's going to come to pass that he's going to need to breathe, breathe underwater. Otherwise, why would you show that object? Okay, and then you're just wasting screen time showing me something that doesn't turn up again. Hmm. And so this relates to Chekhov's gun. This is anytime you show an important tool or you show something in a film, you've got to have it pay off. So early in Indiana Jones or Raiders of the Lost Ark, we learned that Indiana is afraid of snakes. That's established in pretty much the first or second scene. And later on in the film, of course, that comes up when he has to confront the snakes. He has to confront his worst fear, okay? So it's sort of the idea that if, if, if you're going to show a gun in the first act, you've got to have that gun fired. It's got to pay off sometime in the film, or why did you bother showing us that and building that suspense? So lastly, we have plot armor. And again, this is one that you absolutely know. And this is when a character survives a deadly encounter in some lucky way. They say, we say that they have armor in the plot. So James Bond is a classic example, the old ones and the new ones. The James Bond villain always traps him, okay? And this happens in superhero movies too. And then they monologue and they talk about how they've got him, but he always gets away. He's always about to die, but they do it in some stupid way and he gets away. So we say that that's plot armor, is keeping the character alive so that they, they can stay in the story. So one of the worst examples of this was in um, one of the more recent Star Wars movie where Princess Leia was, uh, the ship was destroyed, people were dying, flying through space, but somehow she could fly through space and come to the ship and be safe. We've never seen that power before. It was not foreshadowed that that was a part of the force. So that's the first time we see it. So it feels like, eh, it feels kind of <clears throat> bad to us. And of course, a lot of people complained. And another example of this would be the Deus Ex Machina. And that's when an, an act of God dramatically alters the plot or saves a character from death. And this feels very unsatisfying to the audience. It can be done. All rules can be broken. Remember, it's true. All rules can be broken. But these are some of the things that, that uh, typically get criticized. So moving on, we're going to talk about character, all right? Characters are the most interesting part of any story for most people. We fall in love with characters because we see ourselves in them. Isn't that true? We, uh, they have exciting, distinct characteristics, and you know that's key to the film. People gravitate to characters that they like, that either are like them or are like the way they uh, want to be, okay? Uh, and a good characters connect with the audience, and they're relatable. Remember, we call that identification. All right, so 
Um, here's the definition down here. We talked about that last week. Okay. So protagonists and antagonists. These are, are the main characters in film. There are others, but usually the central character of film is the protagonist. That's the term we're going to use. Sometimes you might say hero, but the proper term is protagonist. They're the most likely to have a most likely to have a love interest in a story. They have the central conflict to resolve. They have a backstory, and essentially the story follows their decisions, not other characters' decisions. Okay. The antagonist, let's keep this in mind, the antagonist could be a person, an idea, an institution, or even a natural force. They have a reason to oppose the protagonist. They, they could be evil, greedy, or opportunistic, or just somebody else who wants to get the job that the protagonist is trying to get. And they often illustrate a personality flaw of the protagonist. So protagonists are <clears throat> really central to a movie and they really carry the film. The audience has to like them, identify with them, enjoy their goals. Now they could be despicable, of course, and the audience will sometimes enjoy that. Um, the main character of the film, sometimes they're called the hero, the lead character, the main character. So in Harry Potter, Harry Potter is firmly the main, the central character, the protagonist. Now, his other two friends are main characters. They're very important, but it's very clear that he and he alone is the protagonist, the central character, the lead character, all right? Uh, most films will have a single protagonist, okay? Uh, they may have two equal protagonists. Occasionally you'll see that, like in Civil War, um, Captain America versus Iron Man. Some films, some films may have what we call an ensemble cast. That's where you have many, many main characters. I mean, Avengers to some extent has that, Knives Out, we have multiple characters, Pulp Fiction. That's where it's maybe the protagonist isn't clear or as clear and you're following several different stories, okay? The antagonist aims to stop the protagonist from getting what they want. Now in some films, particularly genre films, it's a very clear battle. It's human versus human, um, antagonist versus protagonist, okay? But different films are different. So in Enemy of the State, part of what Will Smith is battling against is the system, is the government, okay? And different films have different types of protagonists depending on the conflict involved. Now, secondary characters can be many different types. Um, we have love interests, okay? Mentors, people come along who guide the protagonist. Sometimes you have a narrator character, which we don't meet tells the story and it could be the protagonist often there's a sidekick or a friend someone who's an ally who comes along and helps the character becomes a friend have, brings some new skills to the challenges and then there's henchmen these are people who work for the antagonist or maybe they're you know smaller obstacles along the way and many times these characters have functions they have reasons for existing they could be the comic relief in the in the film, you know, just to lighten the mood. They could be skeptical. They could be a friend who's critical of the protagonist. They could be the ingenue, the sweet, innocent character, or the intellectual, or the emotional character, okay? All these are possibilities for secondary characters. They play different functions in the story to challenge the protagonist or move the story forward, okay? Now, other small parts that we have, uh, we have something we call bit parts, extras, and cameos. So bit parts are small speaking roles. Extras are non-speaking roles. So those are the folks in the background. A bit part might have one line in a movie, like a cashier at a store. A cameo is when an actor or a celebrity appears briefly as themselves in a film. An example I have is Bill Murray appearing in Zombieland as a zombie as himself, okay? So we see... Uh, another famous example of, a, of the cameo, of course, is Stan Lee. If you're a fan, a fan of any of the Avengers movies, because Stan Lee created Marvel Comics and he's considered the godfather of it, he's appeared in a very brief role, uh, what we call a cameo, where it's not really significant to the plot. He has one or two lines in every single movie. So regarding small parts, here's some interesting words from some actresses about their careers and um, why it mattered. So getting back to characters, um, here's another, here's some different examples of fantasy characters. You often have an orphaned hero. There's some kind of hybrid helper. Um, often there's a hungry villain and a wise mentor. 
and a sidekick or foil, someone that goes along with the journey, provides comic relief, or occasionally critiques the protagonist. These are all very common tropes and ideas we see repeated. So let's take a look at Star Wars. It's a classic example of the hero's journey, okay, with clear character archetypes. There's a protagonist, antagonist, mentor, allies, comic relief. So obviously, Luke is the protagonist. The story follows his decisions. He has the central conflict to overcome. Darth Vader is clearly the antagonist. He directly opposes Luke's success. Princess Leia is an ally. Now it's hinted that she might be a love interest, but as we learn in later movies, she was the sister, kind of gets weird. Um, Han Solo is a foil. He becomes a sidekick of Luke, but at first he's skeptical. He's like, you're just a boy. So he's kind of, uh, he's not an antagonist, but he's a, a little bit of comic relief and also a foil for the protagonist. But in the end, he's a good pal and an ally. Uh, the droids are also allies, but they're also comic relief. They exist mostly for humor. They help out, they do things from time to time, but they're really comic relief. And most obviously, Obi-Wan is the mentor, the wise one who guides Luke and helps him along on his journey. So going a little bit deeper, let's break down characters further. We have two different types that I want to mention. We have dynamic characters and we have static characters. Dynamic characters change. Static characters remain the same. Central characters, protagonists are almost always dynamic. They're always going to change through the story. Secondary characters, certainly any background characters are static. They don't change, okay? So that's the most important thing to remember. Dyna dynamic characters, usually only a few in the story, sometimes only one, the protagonist. Their personality or mor morals will change by the end of the story. They'll somehow get better. They'll improve. They'll confront a weakness or confront a fear. Most characters in the story are static. They don't change throughout the story. They support the story in a variety of ways without being the main focus. So we don't learn a lot about their backstory. We don't get their flashbacks. They're sort of there to be evil, funny, helpful, whatever. Okay, so. Let's go a little bit further, further describing characters. We have round and flat characters, okay? Characters that are interesting and have personality. They're complex. They have multiple traits. Uh, traits. They seem real and human. And then we have flat characters. They basically have one characteristic. So C-3PO is... Um, his one characteristic is he's fear. He's, he's, he's constantly concerned with his self-preservation. He's a, a coward. And that leads to all the comic relief. Whereas these main characters up here have multiple dimensions. They're capable of being loved. They're capable of being uh, angry. So flat characters have no complexity or contradiction. A flat character does not have faults for the story to address or resolve. They're just, they are the way they are. Round characters have fully developed thoughts, feelings, complex contradictions, hopes, and desires. That's what creates the goals and the conflict in the story. The story advances because of their decisions that a round character makes, okay? So they're going to have flaws, things that, but they're also going to have some skills, and it's usually some combination of negotiating that that leads to the story. Now, last you have stock characters, and these characters are flat. The flattest of all characters are stock characters. We don't learn anything about uh, stormtroopers. They just are there to shoot, miss, and then get shot themselves. Okay, so reviewing again. Protagonists, almost always dynamic. They change, they grow, they evolve. Most characters, okay, uh, are going to be static. They remain the same. They don't change. Sometimes other main characters might be dynamic, like the love interest or the um, helper but most characters are gonna be static. Uh, main characters in general are round. They're more human, realistic, multidimensional. But most characters are flat. They have one char characteristic. And this is just for efficiency of storytelling. The, the protagonist get, is dynamic and round, goes through changes, we learn the most about him. The other main characters are round. Some of them might change a little bit, um, but we learn a little bit about these folks because they're more important to the story. But the smaller the part, the more flat and the more static characters are. Okay, so again, hooking it up with Star Wars, we see that um, 
these two characters go through changes, but Princess Leia doesn't. She's a round character, but she's pretty much the same throughout the film, okay? Same with Obi-Wan. He doesn't change. He's still the same old wise wizard. I guess, well, he does die. I guess you could call that a change. So maybe I should think about that one. Um, these characters are flat. There's, we don't learn anything new about Chewbacca. He just growls. That's the extent of his character. It's partly comic relief, partly just fun, sci-fi fun. And of course, these last characters are static, flat, and stock. So ensemble cast, you often have different types of characters. You have a leader, you have someone that antagonizes the leader, you have comic relief, you have stock characters even. Um, Ocean's Eleven, you have multiple, multiple characters. Now they all can't be important. We, all, we can't learn about all of them. So some of them are flat and they're just there to, to move the story along. Um, often you have, a, you have the kid, the leader, the wise advisor, okay? Friends, you have different personality types. Inception, different personality types. And all of these mix and make for a much more interesting story. You don't want all of your characters to be the same. They can't have all have the same flaws or the same skills. Let's go further, ensemble cast. So hopefully you've seen Breakfast Club, but you have five different characters representing different types of high school student stereotypes, all right? And this is identifiable. That's why this film was very successful and popular in its time and somewhat still to today because people can identify with these characters. You have the stoner who is round and dynamic. He changes through the film and he's interesting. You have the jock. Now the jock does change, but he's a pretty flat character. You have the goth. I'd say she's round as well. And she does change. They all pretty much change from the experience of being in detention. Okay, but some of them are more flat, like the nerd and the jock, uh, and some of them are more dynamic. Now, the principal, who's the antagonist in the film, he's extremely flat and extremely static. He's always the same. He exists there to be uh, the bug, the problem. And interestingly enough, you even have a mentor character, which is subtly played by the janitor, who actually gives the kids a break and some advice. All right, so that pretty much uh, wraps up character. And when you're creating a character, you want to ask yourself these questions. That what makes a more interesting character, what learning what motivates them and how you can write them in a more interesting way. So let's move on to review. Okay, today we talked about story development, um, equilibrium and disruption. Those are good uh, quiz terms. What is exposition? Explaining out the narrative. Uh, inciting incidents, which get us get the character moving, building to rising action, which then, which then builds to a climax, after which we have falling action. Oops. Uh, and uh, of course, we talked about setting and what that is. Okay. So plot, we said show, don't tell. Many different examples, good versus evil, tragedy versus comedy. Uh, we got into story structure. This was very important. We talked about the hero's journey, linear, episodic, and the three act story structure, all of which tend to blend, usually episodic is a part of that, but the other three work very well together. We learned about some plot tools like foreshadowing. That's when the story hints at events that are gonna come along later. A lot of films use foreshadowing because it adds to the tension. We talked about backstory, flashback, backs, voiceover, internal dialogue, suspense versus surprise, ticking bomb and stakes, plot twists and cliffhangers. Other devices we looked at, story within a story, the quest, uh, the Messiah story, the newcomer, the MacGuffin, the love triangle, uh, plot voucher and plot armor. When we talked about character, we talked about identification, protagonists, antagonists, secondary characters. We talked about what bit parts in a cameo are, dynamic versus static, round versus flat, and what an ensemble cast is. So I'm gonna um, stop the share right now and come back down here. So we covered a lot of information. Uh, please reach out if you have any questions. We're now moving on to our second homework, which covers just what we talked about. There's also a ton of great um, videos to watch that go into even more detail with video uh, for you to watch in as part of your homework. They're usually very short and they explain better than I can just with slides and talking. Hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Reach out if you have questions and have a great week.